Welcome, everyone. Today is October 13th, 2021, a couple of weeks before Halloween. Hopefully, this Halloween will be uh, more fun and energetic for the kids than last Halloween. I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. And this is Medical Matters Weekly, a show about the aspects of healthcare that matter to you most. My guest today is Rory Price, the Director of Population Health at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. Welcome, Rory. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, we're so, we're so excited. Let me just tell you a little bit about Rory. She has a master's in health behavior and health education from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Um, what is a master's in health behavior and health education, Rory? Well, it's a, it's a pretty wide, wide field. Uh, public health touches on just about everything that we do, um, but, but specifically my degree kind of looks at uh, sort of human decision-making, why we do the things we do, and then how to influence individuals' decision-making and behavior uh, to really result in good health outcomes. Which fits right into preventative health uh, care and population health, which we're going to be talking about today. So that's fantastic. She has a bachelor's in social cultural anthropology, also from the University of Michigan, and has worked for several local non 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 for profits. So including Bennington Oral Health Coalition, the Kitchen Cupboard, and Rise Vermont. So let's just start and tell us. I, I mentioned a little bit about Michigan. Tell us about your background and where you grew up. Sure. Yeah. So I'm from Michigan, um, a really small town at the tip of the pinky. So for Michigan, you can use your hand as a map. So I'm from way up here. Um, the pinky uh, area. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so a peninsula on a peninsula. Um, so I grew up kind of surrounded by water. Um, it's a really small town called Northport. There's about 450 year round residents. Um, so you kind of know everyone and they know you. <laughs> So it had that kind of small town dynamic, um, and I, I really enjoyed growing up there. Um, and then I went to the University of Michigan, kind of, you know, entered into the big city in Ann Arbor in the southern part of the state um, and was kind of just shocked by, you know, people. <laughs> there were so <laughs> many people there. Um, my first class, I remember as a freshman, um, was in this big lecture hall, and there were more people in that one class than were in my entire town growing up. So it was a, a bit of a, an adjustment there. Um, but yeah, so Michigan holds a special place in my heart, but I've loved my time in Vermont too. What were your, um, your folks doing in, in that town in that I've already forgotten the name of in Michigan, Northport? <laughs> Northport. Northport, yep. Um, my dad was a, an elementary school teacher. Um, so he's retired from that now and, and does some um, flower and gardening work for the, the village of Northport, which he's very proud of. Um, and my mother actually ran a, a dog boarding kennel. And so we had, uh, you know, at any time, anywhere between, you know, 10 and 25 dogs in our boarding kennel facility, uh, just right on our, at our house. So I grew up around dogs, <laughs> for sure. Is it true that there are more snowmobiles up in uh, your area than cars? Um, it's probably even. Yeah, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot of very nice snowmobile trails, a lot of good cross country skiing. Mm -hmm. It's pretty flat out there. So that definitely helps. Yeah, that's great. So then how did you go into sociocultural anthropology and, and tell us what that means? Sure. Um, so anthropology really is kind of the study of humanity. So both, both past and present. Um, and sociocultural, as it kind of lends itself to, is uh, taking a look at societies and culture um, and how that kind of, you know, create, makes humans what we are. Um, so it encompasses everything from linguistics to diet to um, religion. Um, and I think, you know, looking back, I was really drawn to that just because of sort of the small town that I grew up in um, and just being so fascinated with people and kind of the things that they would do and say and getting to know so many people um, so intimately in such a, a small town environment, I think, uh, you know, really prompted me to, to study that. Um, and so in a way, then you and, and by the way, it is very interesting. It is interesting to study society uh, as a whole. Um, but that's a big topic and you, you've kind of just narrowed it down by going into public health, I imagine. Right. Yeah. Um, so the classes that I found most interesting kind of under that sociocultural anthropology umbrella, um, were things that touched on medical anthropology. Um, so what does it mean to, to be sick? What does it mean to be healed? Those look different, you know, in all cultures across the world. 
Um, and so I was fortunate to do some time um, studying abroad in Ghana. Um, and that really helped to kind of shape my perceptions for how culture can influence health and how there's really no right or wrong, <laughs> um, that it's, it's possible to kind of hold this very research-based view of health, you know, base your decisions in, in science, but then to also respect and, and hold high individuals, you know, cultural beliefs and, and their religion and, and sort of those more personal aspects of their life. So in Ghana, uh, tell, tell me a little more about that, just because I'm curious. I don't know much about Ghana. Sure. Um, so we, we spent some time um, in a small village um, in the northern part of the country, um, conducting some um, surveys and, and taking blood pressures of women um, and talking to them about their diets um, and kind of comparing that with what we were seeing in terms of their blood pressure readings. Um, it was a, a gold mining town, actually. And so um, it was, you know, kind of interesting to see the sort of interplay between, you know, what they were doing for work and what they were eating and how that, um, you know, increased or decreased their stress and then their, their blood pressure. Um, so to kind of look at, at that constellation of, of their life and see how that was playing out in terms of their health outcomes um, was really just so, so thrilling. It's interesting you bring up... Um high blood pressure, hypertension, because it is, uh, we often think of it for some reason as more of a first world uh, problem where we have access to lots of salt and we're more sedentary. Uh, but in fact, of course, it's ubiquitous around the world and um, something that is from a public health standpoint, a, a real uh, a real gain. If you can make um, strides with hypertension and some of the other um, diseases that are so, so ubiquitous like that, you can make a huge difference. Do you feel like you made a difference when you were there? You know, I, I like to think so. Um, for individuals that we identified who did have high blood pressure, they were connected to appropriate care. Um, and so some of the folks that we talked to really, you know, I don't know that they would have made kind of just a general well visit um, to the community's health center. And so having kind of a new group of people there, it was kind of flashy, you know, we had some fun. I think it drew in people maybe who otherwise wouldn't have engaged with, with their local health system in that way. And so, you know, I, I like to think that maybe we identified individuals with hypertension earlier than they otherwise would have kind of, you know, hopefully not had an event or something of that kind, but, um, you know, hopefully we were able to get them connected to services early on. Right, prevented uh, progressive heart disease, stroke, uh, vascular disease, uh, all by controlling blood pressure. And by the way, you didn't hear Rory uh, mention medications at all there yet. Uh, that is one of the treatments for hypertension, but there's many others. And first off, it's awareness and recognition is one of the first steps. So then let's just talk about this. So how do you define population health or what can you tell the audience here about population health? Yeah, um, so it's, kind of a, I don't want to say a contested definition, but everyone kind of has their working definition of, of what population health means. Um, you know, a lot of the times when we think about health, it's very person-centered. So, you know, your individual health and your kind of clinical outcomes, et cetera. Uh, population health is really looking at the health outcomes for an entire group of people. Um, so it can be a population like our patient population, our health service area. So everyone who lives within a certain geographic boundary, um, or you can look at the, the health of a, a country's population. So you can really kind of define your population and then you look at what are the health outcomes for this larger group? Uh, what trends are we seeing and, and what are the disparities? Um, so that's really what we, what we do here in terms of population health is we look at what population are we serving as SVMC um, and, and what, what kind of trends are we seeing? What could we do to help improve health outcomes, keep costs low and, and improve health outcomes? And, you know, for the audience, again, um, if you're familiar with the term population health and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, what does that mean? And Roy just gave excellent definition. Um, she also, if you noticed in the beginning, she, she mentioned it, she, or she was alluding to the fact that there are a lot of definitions of population health. In fact, it's, it's still pretty confusing um, if you go on Google and you look it up. And there are many ways to look at it. So I'm going to give a different way. When I, as an emergency medicine physician, I really wasn't introduced to population health early in my career. It was sort of mid-career. 
And the way I think about it is more of a prospective way to care for patients rather than a retrospective way. Now, th this isn't the only way to look at it, but I'm given an illustrative point. So prospective way, let's use hypertension, uh, would be to know your uh, all of your patients in your what we call a panel in healthcare, but all of your patients for a given practice. So let's say I'm a physician and I manage uh, 1,500 patients. You know, having an electronic medical record that tells me who is up for uh, needs to be contacted and get their blood pressure taken or um, have some type of, of screening exam, that'd be prospective, try, trying to take care of the population rather than retrospective, uh, waiting for them to show up in the office with complications uh, or even for a routine visit, but waiting until that time to do the screening. So again, that's just another way to define population health, but there's, there's many of them. So talk to me a little bit about um, the programs at SVMC in a little more detail. And by the way, for the audience, uh, Rory and many others in the organization that are part of the team have really made some significant improvements in this community uh, with population health, you know, not only working with people at SVMC, uh, but, but over 30, 45 other organizations, including independent uh, primary care offices, uh, and things that you may not consider as typical medical services out there. I think that's a really good point. So much of what population health is, is building relationships with other organizations that, that serve our patients, um, because we know we can't be all things for all people. And so much of what influences someone's health outcome, you know, doesn't happen in our office. It happens out in the world as they kind of interact with these other organizations um, and comes down to things like you know, access to transportation, access to healthy food. Um, so the more bridges the SVMC can build with organizations that provide those types of supports to patients and when we can align our efforts to really kind of provide this wraparound community of services for individuals that really encourages health. Um, you know, that's kind of this utopia of population health that we're, we're trying to get to. Um, and as you mentioned, I think we've made a lot of, a lot of strides towards reaching that. Um, you know, we have any number of programs that kind of align us with our community partners. Um, you know, just off the top of my head, some examples are our opioid response team. That's a group of about 35 to 40 organizations and individuals that, that comes together regularly to talk about, you know, what does our community look like for individuals who are, you know, cur who currently have substance use disorder, who are trying to enter recovery, um, what kind of preventive services are out there for individuals. Um, so there's, there's any number of groups kind of focused on topic like that, that meet regularly to figure out, okay, what are we doing? What's working? And then where are the gaps that we need to fill? Um, and so that's just been, you know, such a highlight of, of this position is working, getting to kind of get a flavor of all these other organizations and what they're doing and, and finding out how SVNC fits in. What are some of those organizations? And you're not going to be able to list off all, all 45, but just for the audience to get an understanding. Sure. Um, so, you know, my mind immediately goes to United Counseling Service as one of our kind of key community partners. They're a designated mental health agency and provide just outstanding service to our community um, in terms of mental health supports. We have our local Turning Point Center, which also does an incredible job in terms of, um, you know, helping folks to enter recovery um, who have substance use disorder. Um, as you mentioned, there's, there's plenty of sort of private practices that also join in. Um, all of our food cupboards, our free clinic, um, you know, we try to get as many people to the table as possible to, to talk about these things and try to strategize how to go forward in a unified way. There really is nothing worse than, you know, us working on something that's duplicative of something else that's already happening in the community. And we're, you know, wasting our time spinning our wheels while they're being successful or vice versa. Um, so the more kind of aligned and strategic we can be in our decision making and resource allocation, uh, the better. Absolutely. And, you know, you, you bring up something that that I just want to comment on. Sometimes people say population health and they're given the definition and they talk about it as uh, as a new um, thought or idea. And in fact, you can find doctor's offices back in the early 1900s that had all their patients listed and they had them in columns about what they needed to get done for all of those. And then they would actually, you know, go to their homes and leave, leave, leave messages saying, you need to come in for this, you need to come in for that. And that's truly population health. The difference there is the ability to work across um, different, as you called them, community partners 
uh, in the area rather than duplicating so that you're organizing that. And we can really focus on another term that's come out and that's the social determinants of health. We can, we can talk about complicated medical conditions that are best suited for in the hospital or in a uh, sophisticated medical practice, but by far the, the best uh, bang for the buck there or the best bang for our effort is focusing on these social determinants of health. Can you just define that real quick for the audience, social determinants of health? Sure. Um, so I'll give kind of an, I guess, an illustrative example. So if you, you know, as an emergency medicine physician, see someone come in who has, you know, um, unmanaged diabetes, for instance, um, you know, I, I guess from an outsider perspective, it could be easy to say, well, they just need to do X, Y, and Z, you know, they just need to eat better. They just need to, you know, adhere to their medication regimen. They just need to do, you know, they need to check in with their doctor. They just need to do something. Right. Um, right. But when you take a step back and you look at that patient's life, you know, do they have the, the funds to pay for their insulin? Do they have a car to get to the grocery store and the funds to be able to, to purchase healthy foods? Um, so the social determinants of health really look at those kind of infrastructural systemic things that either encourage good health or encourage and and, and limit, li limit good health, essentially. Um, so if, if you live in a community that, that doesn't have um, transportation services and has, you know, poor built infrastructure for sidewalks and roads, et cetera, um, you can't expect someone to get somewhere on time <laughs> or safely. Um, so those are really what we think of when we think of the social determinants of health are what are those kind of systemic things that are put in place that can help people uh, to, to make healthy choices and, and to carry out healthy behaviors. That's an excellent description. And, and you and, and your colleagues um, have actually studied this specifically in our community. Um, and the, the result of that was something called the community needs assessment. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so the community health needs assessment is something that all public hospitals need to do every three years. Uh, kind of take a pulse on what's happening in the community. What are the health outcomes for the population? What are the needs of the population? Um, and, you know, it can be viewed as just kind of this regulatory checkbox that you need to tick off every three years. Um, but I think we're so fortunate because our organization really prioritizes it as this wonderful opportunity and privilege to interact with our community and to hear directly from them what they need. Um, and so that's conducted every three years. 2021 is a year that we were due for an assessment. And so um, I've had the honor of spending the last year or so kind of building out the framework for how will we collect this data? How will we analyze it? Um, how will we kind of assemble the report and, and build recommendations based off of what we find? Um, and so that process finished uh, in, in late September with approval by our board of trustees, um, which was really exciting. Um, so my obvious next question is, what did you find? Sure. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how we gathered the data and then kind of say how that data create, uh, you know, created a series of priorities for our community and then a series of recommendations on how to meet those priorities. Um, so our assessment kind of took a three-pronged approach to data collection. Uh, we held a series of community forums to really allow sort of bi-directional communication with community members allow for questions and answers, kind of some of those anecdotes and, um, you know, sometimes emotional stories from individuals about kind of what the health landscape looks like from a community member perspective. So we held five of those uh, forums, one in each kind of corner of our service area, which covers five counties across three states um, and encompasses about 75,000 people. Um, so we held those forums as one way to interact with our community and hear what they need. Um, but we recognize also that not everyone has time to attend an hour long forum and, and maybe some people wouldn't feel comfortable sharing sort of personal stories in that way. Um, so we also had a, a survey that went out to our community pretty broadly, um, and we were able to get over 1600 responses to that survey, um, which statistically is uh, representative of our service area. And uh, so we were really proud of that, that we could feel really confident about the results that we received. Um, so that was another way that we solicited kind of input from our community in terms of what they need. 
Um, and then finally, the, the third prong was uh, me and a few other people in our offices kind of furiously clicking and typing away, gathering secondary data to kind of contextualize and validate what we were hearing from our community. And so that was information from places like the Census Bureau and the CDC, um, just to kind of make sure that everything we were hearing from our community was also supported uh, by those data sources. And overwhelmingly, it was. Um, so we, we can feel confident our community was telling us the truth. Um, so we had a whole bunch of data, um, and when you have that much information, it can, can start to look like everything needs to be a priority. Um, right. and that's something I'm guilty of is if one person is struggling with something, I feel like we need to put all of our energy into solving that. Um, but being realistic, we needed to prioritize and kind of figure out what are the, the top issues that are affecting the most people. Um, one of the requirements of the health needs assessment is to really build a pretty objective scoring rubric um, to do that prioritization so that it's not just Rory as, you know, the czar of population health saying, I think we should do this. Um, so I, I looked to the CDC and kind of modified one of their scoring rubrics um, to really look at, you know, what issues are affecting the most people in our community, um, what issues are, are really uh you know, gravely affecting individuals in our community, sort of what is the, um, the weight of that problem for people. Um, also looked at the, the ability for SVMC to meet the need. So we know we can't, you know, build entirely new service lines for every single thing. Um, so we needed to kind of keep that little bit of realism in the back of our heads to say, what can we do and what can't we do? What community partners can take on bits and pieces of this? Um, and so after going through that scoring rubric, it resulted in four needs that were identified for, for our community. Um, and in order, those were number one, uh, mental health supports for individuals. Uh, number two, encouragement of healthy behaviors and primary prevention activities. Number three was accessibility of high quality, convenient and affordable care. And then number four was um, resources for substance use prevention, uh, treatment, harm reduction, and uh, recovery. So those were the four the four priority areas identified by our assessment process. Wow, that's fantastic. And have you gotten all those fixed? Oh yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's you know, um, it can be a little daunting. You know, you look back at our previous health needs assessments and and they identified similar problems. And so it can, mm -hmm. you know, at first glance be a little disheartening to say like that's still an issue. How have we not solved this? Right. Um, but, you know, there are these large, highly complex, you know, societal challenges mm -hmm. that, that are kind of, you know, happening across the country and around the world. So we're not unique in facing these needs, but I do think that we're, you know, kind of uniquely situated in our, in our community to, to innovate and, and to hopefully meet some of these priority areas. Right. So awareness is so important. Um, and then starting on looking at solutions, recognizing we can't uh, boil the ocean, we can't fix everything, but we can focus. You know, and, and let me just give an example of, of something that has been done with good concrete outcomes. It was a little easier than, than the four you mentioned, but that was in previous health needs assessment, uh, community assessments, uh, oral care, access to oral care was identified as a top four uh, need. And we've worked. There's many um, excellent local dentists, but they couldn't absorb everything. So we, we set up a clinic here at SVMC uh, with dentists. It hasn't solved all of the needs in the community, but, but many of them. And we continue to work with all the local dentists to help uh, try to recruit in you know, more folks here, uh, dentists and oral hygienists and, and other types of oral care. So that's just one example of how we can be aware of a problem and go after it. And sometimes you need that data. We're all aware, right? We could have come up with those four uh, probably off the top of our heads, but we need that data to back up. Not only that it does exist, as you mentioned, that we're not just using an anecdote to describe a problem, uh, but also that we measure how, what, what's the extent, because that'll help uh, govern how we address the, the problem. So uh, we look forward to that. Tell me, um, tell me in particular, as we kind of close up here, I'm looking at the, at the list here we had discussed earlier. Tell me about a success that you're aware of uh, beyond the one that I just used as an example. Sure, yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting because I think now as the director of population health, I'm seeing that, you know, at least in our organization, and I think this is perfect, 
these population health efforts don't just exist within a single department. They mm -hmm. kind of have proliferated across our organization to really be, you know, across multiple areas. Um, so that even though I'm the director of population health, I'm not the one, you know, solely running all of these initiatives. There's so much buy-in across our organization as, you know, understanding that these, that these needs are really critical to me. Um, and so in terms of successes, I think about, you know, in the past, um, our, our opioid response team, I know I mentioned that previously, that came out of one of our community health needs assessments as something that, you know, needed to happen, um, that our community was feeling like, this was a an, an, a an ever growing problem and that, you know, the, the strategies being kind of created to meet the need weren't fully aligning across organizations and across our community. Um, so the, the coalescing of everyone into that group um, has really helped us to make some strides in that in that arena. Um, you know, I also think of the PUC, the psychological urgent care um, for, for children. Um, and how that, you know, has, has helped in terms of mental health for some of our youngest. Um, our assessment findings really showed that our, our younger age groups, sort of the, the 13 to 34 year olds, uh, really seem to be struggling uh, the most. So while everyone is having, you know, their fair share of uh, health struggles, that age group really is uh, kind of in a, a precarious place right now. Um, so going forward, we're going to try to prioritize uh, that younger age group to, to try to build some, some coping mechanisms some resiliency and build some programs specifically for that age group to try to head off any larger problems down the road. Yeah, well, I you know, Roy, we, question or not, it does. And, and I tell you, I'm, I know you have um, a list of your priorities over the next year. I'm not going to ask about those right now. What I will say is that we'd love to check back in with you in, in about nine months to a year to see how things are going for the community um, let the audience know that uh, that there are many organizations, again, that are working on these public health initiatives. If you're interested, you can contact them. You can contact um, our system through our uh, svhealthcare.org. If you want to just learn more or even if you want to volunteer, um, I know someone that uh, contacted me recently. And the next thing I knew, they were at Meals on Wheels doing some work and they felt great about it and they were making a difference. Uh, and that's how a true community gets together and, and works um, and works to support each other. So um, a couple of things. I mean, next week, we are happy to host Dr. Vanessa Brito, who's the Associate Vice President for Campus Life and Executive Director of Health and Wellness at Brown University in Rhode Island. Uh, Brown was one of the first organizations in the country to require vaccination for students and staff as a condition of attending the school there or working there. Um, I'm going to close by saying thank you for joining us today on Medical Matters Weekly. And I don't know if anyone noticed this, but this is the first episode out of about 30, I think we've had, I can't remember, where I did not use the word COVID until right now. So I'm very proud of that. That's an accomplishment for me. Um, I'd like to thank our guest, Rory Price, as well as Mike Cutler from CAT TV. Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, Ashley Jowett from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. I'm Trey Dobson. Go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity, and we will see you next week.